I have not figured out how to make this thing flash yet. Welcome back, everyone, to Is Your Six Cover. Appreciate you showing up, and hopefully you guys are having a great night. Hopefully you got a chance to go check out the X-Ring Channel's new gear. I got two knuckleheads doing all sorts of crazy stuff on the sides here. But with that said, let's have some fun. So topic of the night is going to be how to find a shooting match and start the adventure. So we will get into it. We'll have a little bit of fun. And uh, these guys either need to relax or get the hell out of here, one of the two. <laughs> so first off, we will start off with Daniel, God is my judge, got first place. Jerry Parker's out there, the Shaggy Rifleman. And Eric Hunter, 243. Mike D, Lakeview Outdoors, 45 Auto, Brian T., Tank Frank's out there, Cameron's out there, Bad Billy 429, Big Country, what's going on? It's the Crazy Scotsman, and a whole bunch of uh, Ranger 10 millimeter Jer Bear, Grinding Dust, Rev is out there as well, Abigail, and I think we got everybody, so welcome to the show. Hopefully you guys are tuning in. Now you guys have been on the channel, a lot of these names I've seen for many, many, many months, and... Um, Reason for the show is I want to be able to get you guys to the next step. A lot of you guys have been looking at uh, looking at getting different equipment for the rifles and, and thinking about going out there. And hopefully this video will push you guys to the next level of shooting, actually signing up for a match, getting out there and giving it a try, whether good, bad, or ugly. It doesn't really matter. As long as you go out, you learn something, you have fun, that is the, that's, that's the important part of the whole adventure, right? So before we get going, if you've ever seen this ugly mug, thumbs up the video. <laughs> it's not coming in very well. Let's see if I can do this. If you've ever seen that ugly gentleman, a scary, scary man that he might be, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button. Let me know what, what's going on. we got a few others that have shown up. Welcome to the show. Yep, still the dick. Lakeview Outdoors, Glenn's out there, but um, how many of you guys are on the fence right now thinking about shooting and uh, don't really know where to find a match? Maybe you're, you know, and this match doesn't need to be some rifle, it can be pistols, we're going to talk about where you can go to find the matches, whether it's a PRS style shooting, whether it's shooting an NRL match, whether it's shooting a steel match, USPSA, three gun, we're going to give you the information tonight to give you the locations of hopefully something within at least an hour of your house. So we'll we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But how many of you guys are out there on the fence right now thinking about going out and having some shooting? You guys got to get the hell out of here. <laughs> These guys are trouble. How many of you guys have trouble hanging right next to you? Let's see. I'm on the fence. This whole PRS thing sounds cheap to shoot. <laughs> Charles yeah. Tippy, Charles Tippy, Charles Tippy is a, he's a he's a well accomplished shooter there. Mr. Charles Tippy is very knowledgeable in the field of PRS style shooting. So obviously that was a joke. But hopefully I'm getting some people in here that will uh, think about doing it. <laughs> Why'd you switch to the garbage can? <laughs> switch to the garbage can. The garbage camera? This is yeah. a good camera, I think. All right, why do you switch? Let's see, 2A Refugee coming in hot. Let's see. Uh, well, you see ammo and primers are non-existent. Would love to shoot PRS in the West Kentucky, West Tech, Tennessee. We did pistol and golf balls. I hear Ray's voice. Yeah, he's over here being a pain in my butt. I'm the one that is distracting him. Yes. And nothing like uh, <laughs> shiny objects just bugging the heck out of me here. All right. So let's get into it. Let's have some fun. Before we get going, if you guys are new to it, I know uh, Charles Tiffy, I still have him up here on the board, is not new to the game. But there's a lot of things. Hopefully you can chime in. Hopefully you can help out. I know quite a few of you out there are thinking about it. Bad Billy 429 good buddy of mine. He just picked up a CZ457, and he's thinking about getting into getting some, uh, maybe some possible get out there and do some competition shooting. 
So that'll be kind of cool. I know there's a few others that have picked up some rifles and they picked up some gear and the rabbit hole will get deep and expensive if you let it. But at the end of the day, you really don't have to have all the Gucci, the Gucci stuff. It's just a matter of the most important thing is just go have fun, shoot the match and uh, enjoy it. Enjoy the people you're with. Hopefully you can bring a couple friends and shoot. And that's what it's all about at the end of the day. At the end of the day. Uh, so Ray, did you want to tell anybody about your oh, yeah, comments? Yeah, so, yeah, you know what? I think maybe, I maybe you can get the hell out of here after you do this. <laughs> he doesn't like me distracting him. So really quickly, um, this afternoon I was able to film and review the MDT Skypod. Okay, and it's it is one of the more expensive bipods available on the market. You know, on the channel, you guys know that I do review a lot of really nice stuff. Uh, I have the opportunity to do that, and I figured why not share it with you guys just to let you know what's out there. My analogy has always been, you walk by that magazine stand back in the days of magazines, you see that, you know, the new release of the Ferrari, you know, whatever. It's not like we're going to go out and buy those. Maybe some of you can, and that's fine, but it's nice to know about it, how many horsepower, how fast it will go, what it will do. I had some knucklehead comment on there. So you're saying only serious competitors will shoot a Sky iPod. I'll no thank you. Please, I'll just shoot my Atlas and whatever his name was. You know, and the thing is, is you know, haters are gonna hate whatever. But I, I try to bring it to you guys so that you're more knowledgeable about it. Or if you see one, you kind of understand what it is. You already know the price point. That way, you maybe know, hey, I can afford that, or no, I can't afford that. Well, either way, it's trying to share that information, that knowledge about products that are coming out. And so I did want to vent a little bit because it struck me wrong. You know, I take my time to do the video to try to, you know, bring some information. And you got these asshats that are like, well, I, well, I can shoot just well without it. I'll just shoot my Atlas. Some of the best shooters shoot with a Harris. I get it. Um, but it's nice to know what's out there. That's all I wanted to say. I think you did a good job of saying yep. that. Oh, congrats, <clears throat> Mike D. And she ball sicky. Lead mine in 44. We got a set of 68. I think we're outside uh, loading up some, some of that gear, so it's a little chilly outside. Let's see. Charles Tippy says it very well by saying, I'm going to say don't let the money aspect of it scare you off from shooting in PRS or NRL, or NRL. Take what you got and go have fun. Don't worry about bags or any of that. Data is a big plus, but can get it there. So... With that said, exactly, a lot of that stuff, you're not going to be able to buy every Gucci bag. You're not going to be able to buy every gizmo gadget available. You will need something to be able to write down your data on for your scope, hopefully. And uh, hopefully you have a little bit of that uh, pre-done before the match. But all the Gucci gadgets and Arca Swiss Rail stuff and all that stuff is just extra. And more than likely, I will almost guarantee someone out there will be nice enough to let you borrow something they have, like... If you didn't bring a bag or you need a different rear bag or something, want to try one out, uh, the people out there are usually quite amazing. They'll let you borrow stuff. So I know when we're on our kind of squad, it's like anybody in the squad, if you need any of this, um, you're more than welcome to it. Just don't walk off with it. Um, the uh, Can you be competitive with factory ammo, Glenn's asked. Absolutely. You can. You, you as long can as you're getting, using good ammo. <laughs> yeah. that your rifle likes well and that's the thing you know good quality ammo a lot of people don't shoot uh, reloads whether they don't want to or what but for the most part uh, Mike D says thanks again Ray my pleasure Mike that's D that's right he won a hat over on X-Rings channel so that's pretty cool congratulations Mike on that sorry rig my bag Kreiderman says but I don't know what you said before that the, um, the biggest thing is and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep harping on it is just get up enough courage to sign up for the match. Go have fun. Try to talk a buddy of yours into shooting the match and enjoy the day. Not only will you walk out of there with a lot more knowledge, you'll have a great time. And uh, the best part is just uh, if you have the ability, go out You know, a week before, practice. Do some positional shooting, which basically just means off some type of barricades of something, whether it's a chair, a ladder, uh, a guard like a fence rail post anything that's kind of awkward and weird to shoot off of um, get used to trying to find the most stable way of holding that position to shoot and uh, shoot targets that are small that way if you're lucky the targets were bigger 
at the match that you're shooting than than what you've been practicing on so it'll seem like oh these are pretty easy so just my thoughts is the guest the cop who has hosted on saturday i don't know what that is uh can you be competitive with factory ammo oh yeah um, yeah yeah oh, same guy same yeah dude. simon yep same guy this is the X ring. I think wasn't he over on your? Uh, no, I don't think he was. Oh, okay. I think he came over from KB 32s channel. Okay. Uh, yeah, Simon. He is uh, Ray. He's with the X ring channel. Does a lot of long range precision shooting and different types of uh, shooting events. And actually got me into the long range game. A uh, very knowledgeable guy. And uh, if you haven't got a chance, go check out the X ring channel. Well, I appreciate that. I'm not going to be on here long, guys. But um, I do want to say one thing. If, because you're specifically talking about PRS style shooting, the biggest thing is, is you're going to have to work on positional shooting just like Rick mentioned. However, that's not going to get you to the first part, which is being inundated with too much information with not enough time to do it. Yeah. You experienced the Hornady, same thing Hornady when we match. shot the Hornady yeah. match, which was a national level match out in Utah. It was his first PRS event ever. Both feet and it feels like you don't have enough time. So it doesn't matter how much positional shooting you shoot. If you don't have the data, you're not going to be able to hit the targets. They're all important. So what I would recommend, number one, just have a rifle that shoots. If, if you can hold one minute of angle, you're good. Okay, I would shoot any PRS match with a rifle that I knew and the ammunition that I knew would hold one minute of angle. Correct. That'll get you past the first part. Don't worry about the weight of the rifle. Don't worry about all the bags and everything else. As long as you have one good solid bag, something like a game changer or something like a fortune cookie, yeah. like you've got. Really bad fortune cookie. As long as you've got one, don't overthink it. Okay, you can shoot a match or with a sock just with the rice in it. I mean, yeah, yeah, there you go. You can shoot I mean, a, a you, sock with beans, rice, beans, whatever, rice, corn whatever. doesn't matter. Yeah, you want a scope that is repeatable. Now, with that being said, at this point, it is up to you to have some type of ballistics app or a Kestrel, one of the two. The very first long-range match that I shot where I needed that uh, was the Nordic Championships, and I used Strelock Pro on my phone. It's a $12 app, but it got me everything I needed to have for the distances, the rifle, the bullet, the ammunition, all the velocity that's in there. I actually won that match overall, 80-something competitors, and I was able to do it without the use of a $800 Kestrel or whatever they cost now. But you now, confirmed your data, right? Yeah, you, you want to confirm the data. You yeah. don't want to just you know shoot it at 100 yards, get you a velocity, and assume that all of your data will be correct. Because it will not be. Okay, It can only do so much. So you want to true it up, whether you use ballistic coefficient or using velocity. You want to speed those out and, use, use, and also use your DSF for your drop scale. Yeah. The more temperature ranges you can get, the better off you'll be. So with that being said, if you're going to practice, what I'm going to recommend, whether it's dry fire or live fire, even if you want to just dry fire practice, what you need to do is have somebody write on a card a bunch of dis distances. Okay, you know, have them do like 380, 490, 720 well, or whatever. Yeah. And matter. that's your course of fire. You're not really going to shoot these distances. But when he says go, what I want you to do then is take those distances, because you've written them down, because you're probably going to have a data book or the RO is going to tell you, and I need you to, at that point, go to your Kestrel or your Strelock or whatever, find out what those distances are going to mean for you as far as holding, whether you're right. dialing or holding, whether it's MOA, whether it's mills, that you can write all of that data down and put it on something, whether it's an armband whether it is a Sharpie marker on your arm, which is going to get old <laughs> quick because you're going to run out of writing space quickly. Yeah, let's get a big arm. A data card on your rifle, which could be as inexpensive as a you know, $15, $20 uh, 3D printed card holder or a $129 Hawk Hill. It doesn't matter. But some way to put that information there. And this, just pretend at that point that you've got to go up to the line. And what I want you to do is just pick three different positions. Maybe find a chair, find a ladder, and find something else. And what I want you to work on is setting the rifle down, making sure the dope is on, and just you can dry fire two shots. Let's say you have to engage each one of those targets twice. So dry fire twice in that position. Open your bolt when you move, 
Go to the next position, dial it or dial it before you move. But that's what you've got to get a good understanding of. That's where you're going to feel rushed. That's where you felt rushed on your first one. Well, there was the first section was being able to capture all the Kestrel data. Yeah. Put it on some type of card, like you said, and then... You know, try to get all that done before it was your turn to shoot. Organize have your bags your loaded. Have yep. all, you know, and figuring out what you're going to do. Oh, I'm going to use a bipod for this stage or what I'm going to do. But then, like, going back to the training aspect, set your timer for, like, 90 seconds. hundred, You know, 120 or... And see how far you can get and really pull the trigger knowing that if you're really... We're talking about dry firing now. When, if I was to really pull the trigger and it had live ammo in it, would I really hit it? Or are you just going, oh, there's the dot being, it's not going to be that easy. Now, there's some good training devices out there. Unfortunately, Rick asked me if I had it today, and I don't have yeah, it. But they have this practice. thing that you can actually practice dry firing in the house. I don't remember the name of it. It's really cool. But it's a screen that's a simulator. And you put this cover on the end of your lens. And when you, I think you have to be 12 feet from it or something. But you can take your full high-power rifle, any one of these, get in position, and it looks like that target is 600 or 7 or 800 yards. And you can practice dry firing in a hotel room before the match. You can do it at your house. Yeah. I think they're 100 and some change. I don't, I don't know yeah, exactly. Yeah, it wasn't too expensive. I think it was under 200 bucks. Yeah, for sure. really, really nice uh, but training it was, tool. It was very clear because once you put that objective in front of your, your scope, it made it so you you know you're only I think what was it twelve feet away? It's twelve feet. Yeah, yeah twelve feet away, and you can. Uh, it looked like you were looking into a huge field. It was really cool. Uh, Buddy D, um, you don't have to update it, but more than likely it's going to have more uh, bullets available to you for load data and whatnot. So if you can, why not? It's not going to cost any more. Uh, I will tell you. Here's another really Charles Tiffy can probably back me up on this. Before you go to a match. Go ahead and update your Kestrel if you have one. It seems like they put an update out all the time. And if you're in a place where you don't have um, signal, where you can link it to your phone, you don't want to sit there and wait while it's trying to update. So have all of that stuff organized and ready before you get out to the match. Correct. And then today's, today's topic is about basically being able to find that match. But... A lot of you guys were commenting. I just scrolled up there a minute ago. Um, some of you guys, I think Joaquin said he's got all the gear and now he's kind of getting ready. Um, there's a few of you that are on the on the fence and ready to uh, start this whole thing. Yeah, so Charles Tippy says, as long as you keep the updates good, buddy, you'll be fine. Streelock Pro is probably the best app out there. And guys, you know, I, I hear a lot of people going back and forth and back and forth about, oh, well, I like the Hornady you know, for DOF, I like applied ballistics. I like, you know, Streelock. Streelock Pro is good enough. If you're, if you've practiced, it is good enough to get you on those targets. Is it the best compared to a Kestrel? No, it's not, but it can do a lot. I mean, you can hook dongles up to it to get your wind speeds and everything else. Uh, you don't have to spend the big money on the Kestrel. The Kestrel is just nice if you want it right then and there and to get everything right then and there on your location. What's up, Simon? How are you doing, sir? All right. All right, so we're trying to get caught up, but you know the biggest thing is, is like Rick said, just take the plunge and do it. You know, we have one of the viewers out here, John. Uh, John had never done any type of competition shooting. He yeah. shot, and now he's, he's on his hook. Yeah, he's ready. He's going on his third match uh, coming up in uh, January twenty third, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. I enjoy the snipers unknown challenge, but there are no sniper challenges near me in Arkansas. Um, yeah, you might have to. Will you tell the tell me the true secret of truing your Kestrel with a twenty two long rifle? Uh, Cameron Martinet, that's a great question. It's it's not a secret, but you need to know how your Kestrel works. And the biggest thing is your drop scale factor. Make sure that and Charles, you know, like I said, I don't mind sharing the information, but Charles is saying the main thing with any app or Kestrels is make sure you true the data at eight hundred to a thousand yards. And so he's talking about center fire um, because you're not going to be able to do that with your 22 long rifle. But with 22 long rifle, you definitely want to make sure that you play around with that DSF, that drop scale, so that you're not changing all of your other numbers at the bottom because there's huge, huge drops on 22 long rifle, you know, between three to 400 yards and 400 to 500 yards. 
uh, more so than you're ever going to dial in most any PRS match. Ever. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's guaranteed, I think. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the app. And we're going to go over here. And we're going to start off with uh, matches. And we're going to practice score. So you guys are going to see this. You're going to see when you log in, or now you don't even need to log in. You just put in practicescore.com. Depending on the location that you're at. Arkansas. You know, Arkansas. Let's go to Arkansas. Uh, I think you can just type it in, can't you? No, you can't. What's another one? Let's do, let's see if Tennessee's in here. Get something a little closer. So things start popping up. So I put in T-E-N and Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee came in. And you can scroll in and out, and it's kind of a pain in the ass. So you got to make sure you're off the thing. But now you're going to see different things. you got West Tennessee has a Rimfire uh, NRL 22, you know, and it's got the dates. And you scroll through here, you figure out when you're off work, when you feel like shooting, maybe – Maybe line one of these up with your buddy and go. What hey. type of match off there off to the left? Yeah, so you got IDPA matches here. That's a pistol match. You got a steel match. Yeah, up there. Oh, you're talking about actually yeah. clicking on it. Yeah, so you got 24 USPSA matches, IDPA, you got 18, da 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 da, so on. And then you got NRL 22. So if I click that, it'll just give me those ones. So if I'm just searching for a certain type of match, It'll it basically just kind of a filter. So I'm surprised there's nothing near Arkansas. Even if you type up at the top, if you type in Arkansas like you did Tennessee. Yeah, thirteen matches. Thirteen matches. So let's go down here real quick. We got thirteen matches. I don't know who had asked earlier. But there's a, there's usually something somewhere. You might have to drive a couple hours, three hours, maybe four, hell, maybe longer, depending on where you're at. But we got a steel challenge, so bring a pistol and a bunch of ammo. We got a annual New York bug match. I don't know what the hell that is. Oh, Starts it's IDPA. IDPA. So there we go. We got another IDPA. So there's a lot of pistol. We got USPSA as well. So in uh, Arkansas, there's a lot of pistol stuff. And I think he actually said he didn't. He wasn't able to find any what sniper matches. I think. Correct. A lot of that stuff's not going to be on just this site, uh, everyone. There's there's different stuff. So let's switch over to where's it at? Uh, say you want to shoot PRS style stuff. There's going to be like the snipers unknown and the different matches. They're not going to always be in practice score. Take care, Sam. Have See a good you, night. Sam. <coughs> Um, the Team Safari match that we shot in New Mexico, I don't think that was on practice. No, you can only go to Competition Dynamics to their webpage, and that's how you're going to sign up for their matches. They hold three large matches throughout the year, actually four. You're going to have the Steel Safari, the Team Steel Safari, the Burris Challenge, and then you also have the Sniper's Adventure Challenge. And so that's something that you're not going to be able to access on these type events, but uh, competition dynamics is one of those places to go. You can also go to Sniper's Hide. Sniper's Hide is a great source for information. Yeah, and for sure. you'll have matches in there as well. So there's kind of the the gist of of some of it. So if you're looking for this these style matches anywhere in the U.S. and actually all throughout the uh, the country, they uh, you can find whatever you want. You can scroll out far enough. And go the other way, and you're going to start seeing all those different. And if you're say you're in this part of the world or wherever you're at, you can find those matches, which is kind of cool. The uh, so there's probably something within within a range of what you know. You're gonna have to drive a little bit, but if you're really interested in shooting a match, you know, let's type in. Uh, Let's try California. California is probably tough because, no, nope, look, you got 231 matches. And depending on what you want to shoot, let's see if they got any in our range rifles, 17 matches. There you go. So that's pretty cool. Maybe they'll have one while I'm out there. I go shoot it. January 9th. That's my retirement day right there. Oh, it's a precision rifle. Yeah, match. law enforcement snipers, ammunition limitation, caliber will be limited, and you can click on it. Yep, and if you click on that match, Starts now it's going to tell you everything. 
there you go. It'll give you all the rules. It'll give you the amount of money right here on what the price is to uh, enter the match. Oh, don't don't get down anymore. I, I put my oh, other name on okay. it. Okay. The um, so no, actually I didn't. The uh, <laughs> the uh, whatever, no matter. It'll give you the information so you can you can sign up for it. Sometimes you have to pay depending on the thing. You might just pay at the match. It'll tell you. Sometimes uh, you'll click on it. You'll be able to put yourself into a squad, and then uh, you'll pay when you get there. But sometimes it'll show you that you need to pay, so just pay with your credit card, and you're done. A lot of good information, though, if you're looking for. And what's kind of cool is, I think I can go here. Oh, right there. Stop. Sharing the tab won't stop. No, not yet. The, uh, you can go to the settings, and you can actually go see all your old matches. I'll leave it. I'll leave it. I don't know if I can hit it and give all my information away, but you can uh, show all the matches that you've been you've shot in. And I I don't know how long, but it's kind of cool. So let's see. Yeah. All right, we're still live. Let's see what kind of questions we got. I wasn't able to see any of the comments when I switched over. Let's see the website that Rick's on Shaggy. Let's see another thing. A lot of club matches are word of mouth. Yeah, well said too. Um, you know, going to your local gun shop, you might ask around, and uh, a lot of matches are put on, but they're not put into practice score. Practice score is kind of um, it's a really cool system that lets people know about information. But Charles Tiffy says it best. Those matches that we used to shoot every Thursday night, um, basically a, a fun, friendly IDPA match, those were never in practice score. So there's a lot of stuff going on around you probably that you don't even know about. Um, and it's just a matter of getting out there. <coughs> Go on Facebook, find, uh, you know, Facebook has a bunch of different shooting things that can tell you, you know, when a match is coming up. Let's see, uh, Jack, Jack, the site is, uh, it's custom, yeah, if you're looking for that stuff. Let me see, catch up on this. What's the website name, Rick? Which one? It's uh, Practice Score, and then we got uh, the NRL. You can go to nrl.org, I believe it is. Yeah, nrl.22.org, uh, and that'll give you some information if you're looking for the, the National Rifle League. Uh, 22 stuff that may or may not be on practice score depending on the match and also go to precision rifle series .com. Right no <laughs> no go to precision rifle series .com and those that'll give you all their rim fire and also their center fire matches and i can i can show this one as well let me go back give you guys an idea of this last one and then we'll we'll stop We'll stop sharing again. Uh, this one. Matches. No, that's not it. This one. All right, so the last one I'll show you is if you want to shoot center fire or rim fire, we are at precisionrifleseries.com. And depending on what part of the country you're in, you will go up here. So let's say, well, heck, let's go to central. So that's going to be Texas and around Texas, and you're going to find all these matches. You'll scroll through here. Maybe you can find one that's close to you. There's a lot of matches in Texas, which is really nice. Uh, Charles, I believe Charles Tiffy's out in Texas, and uh, there's matches after matches after matches. Basically, every weekend there's something. But you can scroll through here and find, find one that you want to shoot. You can click on it just like you could the other one. It'll give you the price. Uh, maybe not the price, but where it's at, yeah, and it'll, it'll give you a link over to practice score. So that one is in practice score, which is kind of nice. And I think I can go back right here. And yeah, just uh, if you're in a different, let's go to let's go to the Rockies. So you got all these, and right now, upcoming matches <laughs> is that, which is already done. So those guys up there aren't doing very well. Now, if you see this, when you click on something, let me find an actual busy, let me find a busy one again. Let's see if this one does it. If you see a gold, if you see a gold, uh, this right here, that's the qualifier matches. These ones 
All up in here, I don't see a gold one, is just a standard match. So these could be a one day. Um, depending on the series, if you want to shoot the Pro Series, like Ray and I shot the Pro Series, it was a three day match. And the regionals are usually like a one day. But let's go over to the Pro Series. And you'll see, you can see that's a qualifier there. It's in yellow. And then there's a few other colors. So now you got the AG Cup Series and Pro Qualifier Matches. And then you got the Pro, just the Pro Qualifier Matches. So this kind of gives you an idea where these guys are going to be traveling and, and what kind of, uh, depending on if they're trying to get points or not. So there's a lot of stuff going on. This one over here, there's some stuff going on. What do we got here? A lot of stuff in Virginia. Yeah, Virginia's. That's in North Carolina. Yeah, so nice. But that's that's the way for you guys to get out there. I, I would not suggest maybe getting crazy like I did and trying one of these whole three-day kind of competitions right off the get-go. Um, but with that said, I learned a ton. I was I was humbled <laughs> very very much so and. Um, I learned a ton of because it was sink or swim basically. Some people like to learn in little, you know, little pieces at a time. Some people like to just swallow the whole cow, and uh, I guess that's going to be on you whether you want to sign up for something like that. Those matches are more expensive, just because they are longer. This goes over point standings and all that kind of stuff. Can I see that? Yeah, I'm sharing the screen right now. Or did I click the thing? You, you again? killed it. Oh, yeah, I killed exactly. it. Exactly. I'm glad somebody's awake. Yeah. Damn, you're good, buddy. All right. So, any questions? Let us know. Let's see, any long range matches out to a thousand yards in Carolina? Yeah, there's actually quite a few. Uh, Conservative sniper hunter. There's actually one coming up. The Vortex Challenge, which was part of the Burris last year or the Bushnell last year. Um, that one is in February, and that one you will shoot beyond a thousand yards. Now that is a ruck style match, uh, but they have different divisions. On that one, you had the trooper division, which you're going to hike 30 miles over three days. Then you have the lurper division, which you're not only going to hike the 30 miles and carry all of your gear, but you're also going to sleep out in the woods, uh, regardless of how cold it is. And last year, I think it was down to the teens. And then you also have mechanized division. So if you don't want to do that, you can just drive in a vehicle. They'll haul you. You carry all of your gear and they'll take you from stage to stage. So there's a lot of matches everywhere. I do want to talk about the question that Drew Bradley had. That's a very, very good question. The, the question is, thoughts about insurance coverages, liability, hosting a PRS match on private land, the whole gambit. Porta potties EMS, logistics, format, layout. That would take the fun out. It does. <laughs> it does. Uh, so I have run many, many matches. I used to own my own range. Uh, actually, Sam just left. Him and I actually had a range that we owned and we operated. And we actually got it to the point where we were part of the Three Gun Nation uh, series. And it is a lot of work. It is a lot of money. Um, you have to have insurance because anything can happen. I mean, at any time, somebody can make a just a wrong move and somebody else is getting shot. You don't want to lose everything that you own uh, over somebody else's stupidity. You want to make sure that you have coverage and other people have coverage. That's the first part of it. You also have to think about having not only putting, you know, LZs for choppers for emergencies on where that is, letting them know, you know, calling dispatch, letting them know when this event's going to be held, you know, from when to when, so that if something does happen and you have an emergency procedure in place, so that, you know, you're not running around like a chicken with your head cut off, you know. Um, if you have to medevac somebody out or anything like that, it's very, very important. It's also a lot of setup, a lot of work, getting everything into practice score, coming up with the stages. Um, it, you're not going to make money off of it. It's going to be very difficult to make money uh, you, at best. You might break even or make a couple dollars for the next one, but it's not going to be enough to do anything. Sam and I put on a couple sniper matches uh, last year and a couple three-gun events. You actually helped out setting up on those, and we had a That's handful a lot of, of people that volunteered, Yeah, but it's all volunteer. The best you can do is give them free housing or something. Yeah, you figure it was an hour and 10 minutes away, hour yep. and 20, depending on where you lived. Um, 
you know, you'd drive down there, you'd help out. But it was probably, it's not like you just build this the day before the matches that you guys were doing. It was, it was weeks in it, you know, weeks in advance of planning and making sure the area was clear and, you know, everything was in a row and all the steel was there and cutting the grass, everything yeah. else. Um, you know, now doing we a three gun event is a whole lot different than doing a long range match and you're not going to please everyone. We put on, uh, Sam and I put on a sniper match and it was, it was a great match. It really was, but you've got to be able to cater to pretty much everyone. You're going to, you know, your pro shooters, to the new guy that just started. And we had yeah. some complaints from some of the newer shooters that all the stages were impossible, that, you know, and that, that they were unrealistic. And of course, the US Army Marksmanship come, <clears throat> team comes out and they clean house. I mean, they didn't shoot a perfect score, but it was pretty close to perfect. So you've got to be able to cater to those guys, I mean, as well. You know, the other guys can shoot, but the problem is they made, they made the stages too difficult. Instead of just being. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've talked about this one time on a chat, but we had this really large log. It was a tree that was probably three foot in diameter, and it was about five feet long. And the way the stage was set up, you didn't shoot that match, no. but you and your partner both had to be on the log with all of your gear. Now, this included your rifles, this included your bipods, everything else. Well, all the newer guys were trying to get on this log sideways, and these guys were legs over each other and everything, and he was like, you go forwards, and I'm going to shoot this target at 900 yards like this not even realistic and they were large man-sized steels u.s army marksmanship team i'm going to show you how it was done well, this is what the way it was the stage was set up you both sat on the log feet are off the ground it was a large log you took your pack because everybody had their pack with them you set your rifle right here boom they cleaned the stage Nice. And all the newer guys never even got a round off because they were trying to put tripods with like two legs over here, their buddy holding the leg back. They were reading way too much into it. And, you know, I always say, you don't know what you don't know, but don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Well, and that's the thing about going to more matches, I've noticed. When I go up to the next stage and I see like a barrel, I know... I know how I'm going to have my bipod already set up. I know what bag I'm going to grab. And it's just a matter of going and doing it. And it just makes it that much more comfortable. It's not all hectic and stressed out. Like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do here? It, it gets easier every time you, you go do it. So definitely helps out. The uh, Mac Eve says Wilkinsboro. Wilkesboro. Wilkesboro. And Mac Eve and uh, some of you guys, I'm going to be shooting on the squad with you. I don't know if I told you this. I probably didn't. Uh, but Mini X will be making a reappearance. She's actually going to be shooting the Yemisi match with us. And so I had to move squads because they weren't, they weren't able to move her to my squad. And she's only 14, so I'm going to need to be there with her. Yep. So they've moved me over to you guys' squad. So I'll be able to shoot with you guys. I think Larry Palmer and uh, some of the other guys that watch the channel. So I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, we'll have a great time out there. Just him, though, Bill. It's going to be all the rest of our group, minus minus Ray. Uh, Drew Bradley, yes. In the beginning, it is going to be hard to acquire sponsors for the event because if it's your first one, um, you know some some companies might have an issue uh, just giving you stuff. just giving you stuff <laughs> yeah. uh, because there's been unfortunately, just like someone mentioned in the other chat and everything else. You know, a lot of good people have taken advantage of situations and, you know, let's say X amount of stuff gets donated to the prize table, but only 10% of that actually ends up on the prize table. I'm not saying that happens all the time, but it has happened in the past and that really turns off a lot of sponsors to that because they're like, and they, they take note. Um, yeah. They know what they're they've like, done. I gave you four scopes. Why did, yeah, only why did only two end up? Well, we gave them to the ROs. Well, I mean, I, you know, I know that the ROs are dedicating their time and effort into it, but, and I see that at a lot of events where the ROs get to pick twice and everything else. I get it, but if they are being paid, uh, and a lot of times on these larger matches, ROs have free board, they have free food, and it gives them a free buy into next year's event. So it's a win win, but you're, you're yeah. volunteering your time, and there has to be some compensation for that. Nobody's time is free. Uh, Charles says one thing that hurts the sponsorship is people selling certs. In, in 
Yeah, that's big. I have seen a lot of shooters uh, perusing the table on their phone. How much will you give me if I get this Daniel Defense? Yeah. Uh, okay, well, what are you looking for? All right, and guys, this happens a lot. The top and shooters already have the top <clears throat> gear. and They're not changing gear for what's on the table. No, they're already probably sponsored by Company X, so they can't even use it anyway, so it's like... What am I gonna What am I gonna make? Yeah, or what am I gonna sell? Which is unfortunate for the poor new shooter that you know running. Some. And guys, I'm not gonna hold back. I'm gonna tell you the good, bad, and the ugly because I've been around it and I've seen it a lot. And I've, I've hosted a lot of events, and you know there were the downfall of some of these larger um, organizations that were putting on these events where that was happening. And so yeah, that's just one of those things. It's it's kind of left a sour taste in some of the sponsors' mouth. And honestly, let's face it, guys, unless the company is really, really large, and I've seen this on both ends, uh, people will hit companies up thinking that you're doing them a service, but you're really not. I mean, are you really going to help sell their product? No. No. Uh, That's not really much advertising for them. It is good when they can do it, but it costs them thousands and thousands of dollars. The way it usually works um, is they will sell sponsorship slots, and if you're a gold level, silver level, whatever sponsor... Uh, that gets you, you know, on, in the matchbook, or it'll get your name on yeah, the T-shirt or get, whatever. Yeah. Um, if you're a big name company, you probably don't need that anyway because <laughs> <laughs> you're you're already, the yeah, yeah, exactly. The um, does PRS do level one, two, three matches? We talked about a little bit. There's basically a pro series, and then there's a, a regionals, and it kind of breaks it down into that. So depending on how crazy you want to get, if you're going to shoot the pro series, knowing that. It's the Pro Series. Um, it's going to be like a, I don't know, it's not really leveled out like that, but you will be able to tell by is it a, a one-day event, a two-day event, three-day event kind of deal, so you'll, you'll kind of understand once you see it. Yeah, so Shaggy Rifleman, uh, it's not often that ROs get paid, but they're usually compensated one way or another. Now, a lot of times in some matches, ROs will actually shoot the course of fire the day before or two days before the actual event is held. The problem with that is, is now they're only, they're not only walking the prize table for their position within the match, but then also getting able to walk, being able to walk it as part of being an RO, which that's not bad. Like I said, you need some compensation, um, but it just depends on what organization is putting it on. Uh, good question, buddy D. I know this this one we have coming up. They kind of are uh, shying away from spectators, basically due to COVID restrictions and all that stuff. They don't want extra people showing up. But uh, th- I've been to tons of matches where people can come and just watch and and, and you know get an idea if they want to do it. Best thing is just sign up and shoot the damn thing. Yeah, don't go to a sniper event. No, you or anything like that as a spectator. Um, yeah, it's going to be really be tough work, yeah. working your way around uh, because you're covering a lot of different areas on, on those events. It has to be a big venue. And when we went to GTA, GTA or I, GTA Legion, yeah, they didn't even let spectators walk. Yeah, around. a lot of them won't. Um, so well, that's it. you know, there's insurance part of it because. All the shooters basically sign a waiver, so that's kind of releasing them from a liability. But, you know, a spectator is not filling out one of those forms. That last question, that's a good question, CSH. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do that. Um, are you going to offer the bad MF bag as a prize and sub big shooting match? Exposure is everything. And I agree. I, I, I do get that. However, um, you know, I've been shooting with a lot of big name shooters that have already expressed interest in getting one if i can put it in a couple guys' hands that are that are literally professional shooters and there is a true benefit to using the bag then what better way to market it than that and you know if somebody sees them using it and they believe in it then that's it i think the bag will speak for itself for a competition style shooter uh for your for your guy that only shoots two or three times a year this i'll go ahead and tell you this isn't the bag for you um, it, it's going to be a, a competitor or someone that does a lot of long-range shooting or rimfire shooting that can benefit from it. Well, and you could you could put your you could use it as your little you know briefcase. I mean, you could use it, but it's yeah, designed for the shooter. You know, for competition shooter style uh, makes the most sense. Getting into long range, what caliber? That's going to depend on whether you're reloading. 
whether you want to start reloading if you already are reloading um, that's that's kind of a trick rabbit hole question right now every shooter that's shooting in PRS they think they know what their favorite caliber is until some new bizwam brand new thing comes out so that's a tough one to uh, ask Ramsey country <laughs> he's got he's got quite a few and see this is a great point drew Bradley okay so look the guys I, I get it the bag is not cheap um, but if I wanted cheap, I would have sourced it to China. I would have had them do it, and that bag would have probably been half the price. Uh, but I wouldn't feel good about it because I've already said from the get-go this was going to be USA made, and it was going to be jobs here locally. It is also that true mill spec, okay? Like I said, there, there's been no compromises on this bag. A lot of you guys have already ordered it, um, and you're talking about chump change. So... It's not that it's inexpensive, but people will spend money on stuff that works or helps them win or makes their life easier at a match. Uh, you're not oh, going to carry extra yeah. weight along for nothing, okay? Well, and being able to have your ammo not in a plastic MTM box, and it, it basically I had to pour my ammo into a bag that was bouncing around for three days. It was uh, it was a pain in the butt. It got all dirty and dusty, and that's kind of why you came up with that bag. Yeah, so, that's exactly right. There uh, was a, there was a need for it, in my opinion. So TB, real amateur shooting, there is the whole production side of it, which is designed for people that can bring the rifle right from their, you know, that they already have and go out and enjoy a day of shooting, not having all the crazy equipment. That's what that section is for. Um, but I think if you're going to run a match... <laughs> And somebody wants to shoot it, whether they're pros or amateurs, they're going to... And just don't worry about trying to come in first place. Just have fun. And it's actually good to watch a pro because you get to see how they do it. Hopefully they're shooting ahead of you. Hell, at that one Hornady match, I had to watch all the pros. <laughs> yeah. Last year, one of the best events that I shot in <clears throat> was the Pro-Am, believe it or not, that Microtech put on. It was a great format. It was, it was basically presented to us, us being Microtech, you know, because I, I do work for them, uh, that they were going to put a pro with an amateur and you could not pick your partner. That was the best format ever. Okay, let's say I've never shot a match before, and let's say Rick is a professional level shooter, which that means they look at your finishes over however many matches, and depending on where you placed, uh, whether you're wearing a jersey or not, because uh, a lot of people wear jerseys and don't shoot, and they just want to wear a jersey, uh, yeah. but they basically put you guys together, whether you knew each other or not. Now, when the pro shot, all pros had to shoot first. They could get no coaching, no outside anything, even from their partner. Okay, Even though they're shooting their own match, there was no, there, there actually was a team on that, that they did a combined team. But what they did was, is for me, let's say I'd never shot before, it's my first three-gun event, he is allowed to coach. He can actually have his my ammo here or in front of like him. a mag. Ready he can to say, go. "Don't forget that target. Don't forget that target. Here's a spare mag if you need it, you know, or whatever." But that gave so much learning to the guy that had never shot the match, and you can see exactly how the pro breaks it down. He gets to see it first, yep. and then he gets the coaching in his ear from it. And that went over so well. They agreed to do it again this year, uh, coming up for 2021. And that was a great format. Really enjoyed that. Yeah, and that's that's a pretty big match, though, to start off with. Yeah, yeah, it was a big match. So, you might want to go to a couple smaller ones before Yeah, that. Drew Bradley, no problem. Didn't take it the wrong way. I just wanted to kind of explain that. All right, what else we got out there? Any other questions? Has this chat tonight helped push anybody to go sign up for a match, or at least, like, really think about doing it because if it's if it's helped one person and uh, you know trying to be trying to be good like an ambassador to the sport of shooting it's like let's get people out there that's the reason why i we i think i do this is to get people to want to go out and shoot yeah so this is a great question um so i assume charles tiffy volunteers to be a range officer and i did that for years that's actually how we met uh, I was the RO 
for Rick and KB32 and, and uh, Pops Quest. That's not how we met, but yeah. Yeah, that's not how we met, but I actually had a match where KB and everybody else yeah. was the first time I ever met him. I was the RO. RO just means you're a range officer, a range safety officer. Some people call them RSOs. Uh, but basically, you're running a squad. You're making sure that all the scoring is done correctly, and you're basically in charge of that squad. You're in charge of reading out the stage description, usually verbatim, getting through it, being in charge of safety, making sure that no one's doing anything dangerous. Mm -hmm. The problem is, it is hard to compete at the top level and RO at the same time. If I've already shot the match, let's say on a Thursday or on a Friday or a Thursday before the actual event starts and my, my game is done. I've shot my match. I've shot my best game. Then that yeah. leaves me free to do nothing but RO. And that's a great way to do it. But if you want to go into this event, because not all of them do it that way. If you want to go into this event and RO and shoot it on the same day as the shooters. That's extra hard. It is extremely, extremely difficult because it's going to be hard to get your mind into the game and stay focused. You're trying to watch these guys in their safety and along with okay i want to run this i got to do a reload here like that's that's a lot of brain power going on yeah and it's not that it can't be done but well you it, know it's it just it, it, it's, it's just a lot to do if you're trying to win i mean i would never I, me personally i would never try to ro personally like a regional state or national level match i'll do it for lo for local matches yeah. and unfortunately once you kind of get Known to be a range officer down here, range officer. They go, you're here gonna you get, go. You're going to be voluntold here's, here's that time. they are short on range officers. <laughs> and you're one of them. And they're going to be like, Rick, we don't have ROs. Can you RO the squad? And you're like, uh, yeah, I don't mind. And when, in fact, you really wanted to do something else. Yeah, like be able to screw off like the rest of the guys. Let's see. Hell yeah, I pay off a Tika next month for your stuff. Definitely plan to compete in 2022. USPSA Nationals is the goal, 2021. Nice applied performance. Yeah, keep up on the pistol skills. But I'm telling you, you're going to like that bolt gun better, buddy. Anybody can shoot a red dot. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's see. Actually, I can, in fact, inspire me. What's this? Uh, you guys chats inspired me approximately a year ago or so to go down this adventure. Yeah. Now, Charles Tiffy, I assume he's talking about the same thing I was mentioning. Uh, there will be a huge time crunch just trying to get all... Guys, there is so much mental preparation. It's not about being the best shooter. It's about keeping it all up here and being able to recover because typically with the shooters that have less experience, the minute something happens, let's say like a mag falling out at the most oh, inopportune yeah. time, um, <clears throat> your, your, your world's going to go to poop in a handbasket, all right? That's what's going to happen. Uh, because you don't have the mental aptitude at the time to, to just know. I mean, I gave this as advice one night on a chat. You should be able to close your eyes, know where every single target is, where you're going to do your reload. Whether you're talking about three gun, whether you're talking about, unless it's a blind stage match, but even PRS, you should be able to know, I'm going from this rock to that rock, I'm engaging that target how many times, and you should know the approximate distance. You don't need to know the exact yard because that's what your data card's for. But that's how you should enter every stage before you shoot. Uh, that's not typically what happens with a newer shooter. A no, newer the, shooter timer, is like, the timer oh, crap, makes this that's noise. Done. The timer makes this noise. Beep. And then, it, yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, I've seen people actually hell? freeze on a timer. They're just like, oh, what am I shooting first? And I'm like, those targets right there. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you don't want to coach, especially if it's a non coaching match, but I don't want the guy shooting at these targets over here. Uh, you know, let's say if it's a slug target, I know he's got slugs in there, and he's shooting at a steel up close, that's going to get him yeah, uh, DQ'd or worse. So even better, get, you know, sent home. And that's the thing go slow, safety in mind, especially on your first few matches. You don't want to be DQ'd. Yeah. Ask questions. If you have questions after they give the brief. Applied Performance says, I listen a lot, but I'm dry practicing, so don't get to comment. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. That is something that I'm guilty of. I do not dry fire or practice a lot. You have a range like right out the back door. I do, and I usually shoot every day, whether it's off the front porch or the back porch or out in the woods or whatever, but I don't practice a lot. Which is oh yeah uh, you don't uh, no yes. I used to get mad at him I'm like I'm a man we need to like 
do some when it was three gun was like yep. I'm like we need to like load shotgun shells like get used to quad loading again like oh yeah I don't, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just like jeez I guess when you got it you got it well no it's just years and years of practice I mean it's just yeah. like with anything else um, but you do have to you do at some point you're gonna have to dedicate the time and practice um, the other thing is I'll tell you Rick's made a lot of progress um, we were practicing the other night off the porch some of you guys knew that. You know, we put lights out in the woods and had the targets out there. And he's come a long ways in a short amount of time. And it shows because I remember the first time I took him to the range and he shot long range. And so just seeing that growth and it's even though he's embraced it, it is it has been a long time. It's taken him a long time uh, because it's not something you can do every day. You were going back and forth to California yeah. for, you know, 10, 15 days at a time. So, you know, you were putting in the time and effort and it shows now. Well, and dude. Do- because of COVID and that whole uh, off for a while deal, I mean, we were hitting it hard like that two yep. months. Yeah, that definitely helped. Yeah, during COVID, we shot more than we ever shot. Yeah, it was it was awesome. And guys, we were practically neighbors. I mean, just right down the street, and it just makes it easy, especially if we want to get something zeroed or what. You know, he, he got he got pissed at me the other day. He's like, "You didn't call me. You went shooting." I was like, "No, I had to mount a scope on Mini X's rifle and get it dialed in." He goes, "Well, you still shot." I'm like, I zeroed I did. a freaking I did. 22. I'm I like, didn't think I needed to call you. Like, any day you can shoot 25 rounds and shoot on some position, do some positional shooting, like, yeah, I was a little sad, actually. I was sad, but then I'm like, okay, whatever. He's just worried because I'm getting better. Uh, Jason Johnson, that is going to be in Yemassee, South Carolina. It's about 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes outside of Charleston, South Carolina. That one is full, though, right? CJ uh, Johnson, did you get my email about the gas pedal for the Q5 Walther? No, and just so you know, the Q5 Walther was not my pistol. That was actually sent to me to review. Uh, I don't own that pistol. That specific pistol was uh, provided to me by uh, Ethan Manning over at Manning & Sons. Um, Any, like, the Wilson Combat pistol. That was also provided by Manning and Sons. So, and I always try to give a shout out to them um, anytime something's sent my way, which I, I don't take a lot of stuff in because I only do videos when I have the opportunity to do them and I don't want to feel like I'm pressured to get something out there. Shibo Seki, that one right there is the Infinity 9mm uh, 2011. The, um, no, Charles, Charles Tiffy says it well. If he's going to do it, he's going to skip the dry fire and, and just shoot. I think that's one of the reasons why I really wanted the 22 long rifle stuff with the Ruger RPR when we first started the adventure. Is, yeah, I want to shoot. I want to use the scope. I want to dial. And the only way to do that cheap is to shoot a 22 long rifle. You don't have to reload. You don't got a case trim. You don't got to do this. You don't got to do that and all the other crap that comes along with it. You just go shoot and have fun, and man, we had piles of brass when we first got those Rugers. Yeah, it was that's dry fire is definitely beneficial, just like a sure. performance said. Uh, it focuses on you know I, I focus on movement and mechanics, and, and I get it, um, but I can only perform so many reloads and uh, before I get bored with it. I, I'm one of those that I just prefer to do live firing. Yeah. Well, and I could see that being a bigger beneficial kind of deal with pistols kind of stuff. But, like, when you're super stable and you got the bipod, say you're going laying prone, I mean, that rifle, unless you're really just slapping that trigger, you're... It's not moving at all. So I want to say something. This might be misconstrued a little bit. Slap it. Um, So PRS is not an athletic event at all. Okay. That's one thing that I can tell you coming from the background of going through athletic events. Anytime I'm with these guys shooting and they want to work or train on something, it's let's go run around the block. Let's do 10 push-ups. Now get on the rifle and do it. Doing that simulated or induced stress because if you can perform under those conditions with an elevated heart rate and make those shots, that's what makes all the difference in the world. I'm not saying PRS is easy. I don't want anybody to mistake that because it is not easy. It's Positional tough. shooting is very, very tough. But anything you can do to add to that, I think will only make you a better shooter. It's just like when I convinced you to shoot the Hornady match. I'm like, you probably won't shoot a harder match. Yeah, ever. Ever. <laughs> I said, but 
you know what, you're going to have a good time and, and you're you'll learn, learn a lot. Yeah. But after that first day, I felt like I made a mistake because I thought Rick was just going to sell everything. He was not. You were not a happy camper the first I, day. I came off that mountain going. I am selling all my crap. No, I, I never thought that. I never thought that, but I was you like. You pretty much said it. I got my, <laughs> I'm a, I was thinking to myself like, I suck. Like, that's where I felt. Well, the, the biggest thing, the thing truth was, is you probably did. I did. But you learned, you'll never be able to take that back. I mean, that's that, <laughs> what you learned. I'll never want to do that again, but yeah. Did you learn a lot about the Tika and the magazines? Oh, yeah. I wanted to throw those mags out the Correct. damn window. So you learned about your equipment. Yep. What did Everything you... else did great. The scope did well. Yep. Actually, I use your scope. Yep, the well. primary arms. To stay in production. Um I think there was just the disappointment of shooting with all the pros, watching them do well. I mean, I got to learn cool stuff, but I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. Just like cluster F'd at every, every stage almost. Yeah, Charles Tippy says it best here. Um, figuring out the wind. Guys, this is something that you're not going to – not that one. Sorry, it was this one right here. So – Unless you've done a lot of long-range shooting and you can see the wind indicators, and at best, sometimes it's just an educated guess. You really don't know. Um, that can be the most disheartening thing, especially, I, I think oh, you funny. ran into that. Because oh, we had crazy, had, crazy winds. The pros were getting goose eggs. Correct. That was crazy. So you're shooting through a canyon, so you got also a crosswind, like. <laughs> yeah, but there's wind coming up off of the mountain this way, too, sweet. so I was like... I mean, even they were missing, so I was feeling better, but I'm like, this, I'm not in my element right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, and it can be tough, and that just comes from years of experience. That That's not something you're going to read or learn off the internet. Uh, it can give you some guidelines, but it's never going to be a replacement for actually doing it, going out there and doing it. The reason why this is such a good sport, in my opinion, is... You can be not in perfect condition and go out and perform and do a match. You you can't be limited like really handicap limited, but you can you can go out and do stuff and not be at top performance. You know you don't have to be a yeah. massive CrossFitter and uh, you know swim three hundred miles kind of deal in order to do this. So it makes miles, it a, that's a long swim. That's a lot of swimming. But what's nice about it is you can do this kind of like golf for many years. That's yes. what I like about and, it. And I do like that part of it. I do. I do I'm like going it. for the senior gold bracket. I got ten more years. I'm gonna get me a. I'm gonna get me a senior trophy one day. Can't wait. Yeah. If I make it that far. <laughs> Let's see here. Three hundred fifty pounds. Yeah, there you go, right there. There's a few fellows pushing 350, 400 pounds that shoot PRS. Yeah. There will be a few awkward stages, but most... Actually, one of the pros that I shot with, he was a pretty big boy. I mean, uh, but he was a pro and he shot well. I mean, he knew what he, knew what he was doing. Great yeah, dude. Charles Tiffy, absolutely right. Um, he says, anyone can shoot it. Hell, there are kids, 10 to 12-year-olds, shooting the same stages as, as adults. Exactly. Uh, you know, and that was the same thing with, I you know, with Mini X... Yeah. You know, getting her started, I mean, she's a decent shot. She just hasn't done it in a while because she's been so busy with school and everything. But, you know, she's going to shoot this match. She hasn't shot a, She hasn't shot anything in months. I know. It's been months and months. Um, you know, school takes precedent over everything So right now. But uh, we did get out there, and any day it's not raining, we will be training because I, I don't want her to get discouraged at this. She's never done um, a yeah. rimfire match. Hey, Andrew. No, and she's going to do well. She's going to do well. She has, uh, she's got the mechanics, you know what I mean? She's, yeah. She knows what she's doing. It's just a matter of getting out there and doing it. Yeah, I did lighten the rifle up for her uh, quite a Shorten bit. It. I had to adjust the length of pull uh, mm -hmm. so that it fit her really well. But first day was just getting really comfortable with all the controls again and just almost dry fire, just basically going through the steps, knowing where everything's at, how to do the reload. There's nothing worse than trying to do a reload on a – CZ 455, and you can't bag. find that little tiny little hole there because you don't want to do this and look underneath it, and you don't yeah. want to sit there and be stabbing it to death. So just getting those mechanics and familiarization down. Yeah, practice. 
That's what it boils down to, I think, is practice, practice, practice. That's why I think the twenty two long rifle stuff is It's taking off. It is so much more fun than PRS for a couple reasons. You're doing the same thing, but you're dialing a lot more. It's a lot quieter. So yeah, people can so communicate, nice. have you know, they can talk and it's uh it's not just all day long, boom, 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 you know, for eight hours and I don't mind that as well I mean I'll be shooting some PRS matches hopefully coming up soon but I'm just like it is it's nice it is very nice there's five matches coming up locally that I'm going to be shooting isn't there five four yeah five. I think there's five in the series yeah, yeah. there's going to there's a series that's local to us so I want to be shooting that series I'm assuming you are as well he signed up for the one I signed up for the one, so we should be rocking and rolling. Yeah, 2A Refugee, she will be shooting. I just got it zeroed the other day. She'll be shooting the CZ455 that Matt shot in the last match. Matt's got his own rifle now. Yep. And then um, I did put the Vortex Razor HD on it and <laughs> took some of the weights off of it, adjusted the length of pull, and just got everything dialed in the other day. Nice. And that's got the... What's that trigger on that thing? That one has the Mr. Fly CZ yeah. trigger. I can never remember yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> think about a fly. I was thinking cat for some reason. Yeah, Charles Tiffy. Great, great advice. Guys, if you shoot a 90-second stage, it's going to feel like you were there for about 10 seconds. When, that, yeah. when, the, when they say begin or you know the buzzer goes off, 90 seconds is gone instantly. I, I remember. I mean, it's it's like, whoa, what just happened? I, you know, it's just the way it goes. Make those shots count. It's like he's saying. Even if yeah. you only get three Don't get shots, all 10 off and not hit shit. Yeah. Even if you only hit one or two, it's better than zero, miss, you know, 10 misses. Yeah. The only problem with PRS in, in that is that you have to think. It's not three gun where you can just keep shooting and your time's burning away. The stage is more than likely going to say, shoot one shot, hit or miss, then move. Yeah. So and it's if you miss, a harder and you're like, what's going on? Was I high? Was I low? And you go to the next position, boom, and you miss again. This is I see this time and time again. They can't see what's going on, and then they start questioning the rifle, their position. They don't know if they're shooting low. They're not shooting high. Um, Bill Sweeney, yes. yes, VOD has posted their match schedule. It is live on Practice Score. You can go to Practice Score Just and sign up for the match. Just the first one. But the match uh, on their website, Facebook Facebook website, tells the uh, dates of the next four as well. So get your butt over there. Get posted up. Let's see. PRS, but ARs take up all your money trying, a per, trying to perfect them to... Cl- Get close to a bolt gun. She ball sicky. Great, You're not gonna. Great question. What's the old she ball sicky say? In your next PRS match, do you think you'll use the Area 419 Maverick suppressor slash brake? And I will. Um, we've already shown that the suppressor can degrade your accuracy slightly. Uh, however, I don't believe it's enough in PRS style shooting. The 22s. I'm telling you it. It's tight. It, these tight. These targets are so tiny, mm-hmm. but uh, it's not going to affect it enough on They're a full size big. center fire. A I don't think to where it's going to be that big of a deal. So yes, I probably will run it. These ones are. That's the size of some of those right there. The cat or smaller. The yeah. KYL is a quarter inch target. Yeah. Yeah. Bolt upper on an AR. Vanessa Kitty question. I've Dave. never tried the Yo Dave Mike D. Uh, only I went straight from the factory trigger to the Mister Fly setup. Squad four, Bill. Uh, but I generally have much going when they are alive, so they're distracted. Yeah, let's see. We're at an hour. Any other questions uh, when it comes to PRS or other types of matches? I really want to get you guys to sign up for something. Get you out there. I want to get Charles Tiffy on the uh, on the chat one day. What's up, Adrian? Adrian, the um, so let me know, Charles, if you ever want to get on your live, talk about the same stuff we're talking about now. It'd be fun. It'd be fun to get you on here. DW says uh, I would love to do PRS shooting, 
but ARs take up all your money. You can shoot in the gas gun division in PRS. They yeah. Some of them offer that. I know even at the big match that we went to, they had a gas gun division. I think there was so six. So if, you, if you're chasing that perfect AR to get it as close as you can to bolt gun, then use that AR that, uh, that you've got and shoot in that division. <clears throat> you can definitely do it. It's the future of these sports, so important. Yeah, thanks, Drew. Appreciate that. Okay, so I do want to talk about this. Man, there's some good topics here. So back in the day, way back in the day, we're talking about you know late 80s, early 90s, the thing to do was to have a rifle, you know, like a Remington, and you were going to have, you know, all this work done to it, and you were going to put it in, let's say, a Macmillan stock, and you were going to glass bed it, and it was it was nice, okay? It was the best we had at the time, okay? You, you go in there, you glass bed it, take it back out, and you're going to skim glass it, and you're making sure everything's made it right, get all your torques right. And then we started seeing chassis systems. <clears throat> the first chassis system that I actually started using or seeing um, was like you had the McCree's, you had Kadex, uh, you had some of these other ones that were coming out there. And it made it really simple because you didn't need to bet it. You already had your, your slot in there for your recoil lug. <clears throat> it was really important to get your torque right on your action screws. But you just basically set it in there, banged it, set it, set the torque and you were good to go. And it was repeatable, really was. That is where the push has gone. You guys know I was playing around with the manners. That thing was an absolute pain in the ass. There's more, more to that story than you guys know. That thing was set up for the Stiller, the one that I won back in 2014. I actually used that gun and won a really, really big match. And it worked really, really well. But when we took that out, and tried to use it with other actions, it didn't work. It was horrible. And it just caused all kinds of issues. Um, you know, right now with the XLRs, the MDTs, and so many others, you can just drop that action in and usually you're not even gonna have a problem. You know, back in the day, we were having to get different bottom metal and are you running detachable box mags? I'd say stick with the chassis. It makes it a lot easier. And, yeah. and you take that chassis and more than likely, depending on what you're putting, it might fit on your next rifle. Easy that people are still paying a thousand plus for traditional stock setups that still need to be better. Yeah, th that's a great, <laughs> great comment right there. And I don't know what Charles Tiffey or Ramsey Country says about what I just said, <clears throat> or if they agree with me or disagree. Um, but that. yeah, it is crazy. And not only that, if you order something from McMillan, nice. you're going to be waiting a year. Um, you know, nine months to a year to get it, and you're still going to have to have either you're going to have to know how to to bet it. Or you're gonna to have to have a gunsmith do it. It's it's not that easy. For the MDT, it's just drop it in. Yeah, you're like, yeah. oh, I want to take it out real quick, and then <laughs> you can put it right back in, and it's pretty much good to go. Yep. I'm going to buy a bolt gun, bolt action. Yeah, shotgun. Jerry Parker says pillow bedding, which it's it's um, and it's probably autocorrect on that, but pillar bedding, P I L L A R. It's where you're using aluminum pillar blocks. And you're basically setting it in there, and it's basically giving it something to rest on. Uh, but that's what pillar bedding is. Aluminum pillar bedding was was really popular back in the day. Uh, Mike D says people are trying to build a replica, say M24 or similar, but the average person build is not worth it anymore. That's exactly right. If you're trying to go with an M40 or an M24, and you're trying to build a, a perfect you know clone or replica of that, that's really the only purpose because it's an old school classic style but what you're going to lose on that is a lot of the adjustability on the fly being able to adjust length of pull and you say well once you set the length of pull you don't have to mess with it well guys the difference is you shoot in the summertime and you're shooting in a t-shirt like this yeah and then now you're trying to make it through a match where let's say like uh when they did Two the prs finale the freaking... the prs finale it was like 30 degrees it was high high winds and you've got two or three jackets on well you might want to adjust that length of pull you know, you might want to adjust that cheek riser if you're wearing a, you know, a balaclava or something like that. <laughs> yeah, because so, you're freezing your butt off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Charles Tiffey, the only uh, foundations are very popular. Um, you know, those are done with, I think, uh, micarta or linen micarta, something like that. And a lot of guys actually run those. It's supposed to be stronger than uh, 
most everything. Cool. Yeah, and I like MDT guys. I'll just go ahead and tell you my preference has been the XLR chassis. Uh, I'm going to stick with those. I really like them. They just fit me better. I think um, I think they're heavier than the MDTs, which can be a, a downside to them. But you know, MDT makes great stuff. I'm not going to say Ramsey Country about. bids as F class builds. I didn't know they did that. I don't know anything about F class, so that's why I like learning from Ramsey Country as well. Let's see. We we're taking 2020 technology all the way down to the bullet level and using. 1980s stocks technology. <laughs> there you go. That's well said. Yeah, if you go to Shaggy Rifleman, the one right above it, this you one? know, there's a, no right above the blue one, uh, right there. So there's actually a couple stocks we talked about recently where they're starting to blend both of those, where you have a chassis system, and I cannot remember the name. I'm sure Charles. Matt showed me that. That's yeah, I actually cool. showed Matt because oh, yeah. it's a beautiful, yeah, beautiful chassis. They're made here the in North Carolina. The grip was all beautiful wood. And then it still had the Arca And, and I think that's going to appeal to the guys that want that classic look, but they want the the configurability of a chassis system. Yeah. Uh, really, really The modularity, cool. too. Yeah. Vanessa Kitty, it's XLR Industries. That's exactly correct. Yep. Those are nice. The JV Pro. Yeah. Charles Tiffy, that XLR certificate, you know, I just cashed one of those in and it took uh, two months. Um, it is the, I went with the, uh, what I'm running right now is the XLR JB NV Pro. It's the full kit. Uh, it comes with pretty much everything. The, you know, the thumb rest, uh, the, the weights, all of it. Chassis with wood inserts on the chassis. Yeah. Yeah. It's much. basically what it is. Yeah. It's kind of beautiful though. It's got a really expensive looking wood on it. I don't know what it is. Kind of like a, a really expensive shotgun, shotgun stock. Kind of wood on it. it so for really those cool. those that are aficionados of old uh, HK stuff, you know, so like the HK P sevens or the you know P seven M eights or the M tens, there's nothing that looks as sexy as an HK P seven with a set of Neil's grips on it. You have a full steel pistol that's got these just beautiful wood grips on it. That's kind of what they've done. They've kind of blended in this you know this this beautiful metal with great machining. And, you know, I'm going to look it up and see if I can find it, because I think you guys would appreciate this. Go ahead. Uh, Drew Bradley, I don't know if they're still doing the uh, shocks in the buttstock or not. That was something that came out years ago. I remember shooting early 90s, and uh, this one right here. And uh, there was a lot of shooters that had switched over to that. I, it takes out a little bit of the recoil, but... Yeah, so guys, I did find it, and they are made in for, North Carolina. What is it, Furusha? And it's uh, Wooks, Oops. and it's uh, uh, Furiosa, I think it is. But I'm going to let you guys see this, but look at that. I mean, it's not focusing, but yeah, you see that? So you've got this beautiful wood with all this machined aluminum that's over here. And let's see if I can find something else. It's just it's just a beautiful setup. I know nothing about them. I've heard good things about them. It's good looking stuff. But it's really good looking. Little chassis, I should say. It's neat. Wooks. W-O-O-X. I'll put it in here for you guys. W-O-O. -O. Yeah, it's a work of art. Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh, Mike D? Now, are those comparable in price to... All yeah. the other crap. Yeah, they are. They're not that buying? bad. Yeah, twelve, thirteen hundred, or something like what that. What is the widest rifle on your right? That is a as an AR-10 camouflaged. With yeah, the, that's that. Yeah, yeah, it just kind of blends in. Yeah, it's camouflage. It's supposed to. Any environment. It's it's is your six covered camo. You can't get any better. Rattle can, baby. Rattle can. Let's see, let's see. Have you heard of any information about the Drake Athena Precision Chassis? I haven't. Yeah, Drew Bradley is talking about a Ruger shotgun. I think uh, he says it was made in the 50s. It had hydraulic pistons on the back. Uh, that was kind of common. You know, Ruger had their whole, uh, their, their uh, what was it, the red label shotguns. I mean, those could get kind of expensive. I mean, not like a Parazzi or anything like that. But they actually had hydraulic absorbers. Hydraulics were used quite a bit. You know, even H and K used hydraulic. Um, they have an option. Somebody's made an option of hydraulic buffers on the um, 
it was the P7 K3, I think it was. It was a 380. It had interchangeable barrels. A very, very unique pistol. If you ever find one of those, pick it up because it's worth a fortune. <laughs> but anyway. Fully adjustable like an Autobot Transformer. Yeah, so there's quite a few of you that never heard of Wooks. And like I said, they're a local company and, you know, they've taken it out of the box and stepped it up that next level for, you know, for that classic look, but still having all the adjustability. It's it, why it, I only can't shoot got, production. It's got some sexiness to it for sure. Because that CZ, that wood stock, it just had no adjustability for yeah. And so it was just, I'm not going to sit there and put duct tape and everything else. I mean, I wanted to feel good about the rifle and, you know, it's like, man, it's just, it's not working out. So that's why I had to change the chassis. I hope she just embraces the heck out of that and just starts whooping ass on everybody. She probably beat me. Were they basically shock absorber in the butt? No, no, it was, it was cleaner looking. It was just it looked like a piece of billet machined aluminum. There was two of them in there. Yeah, like this, they had the uh, recoil pads. If you guys have never done any uh, sporting clays with live birds, I was invited to an event uh, once and only once. Uh, I don't. Just it's me personally. I'll just share this. I'm one of those. I don't think killing unnecessarily is a is a sport. I mean, if you're going to use it, if you're dove hunter and you're eating it, whatever, that's fine. But just to shoot birds and just let them fall and do nothing with them, that yeah. didn't sit over well with me. But uh, yeah, you got to put some bacon on that meat. And yeah, so it. I got invited out there, and if you guys have never done it, they. I mean, when I showed up, it's like everybody was driving, you know, a Land Rover, Mercedes, or something. It was really, really upper class. And the guy was like, here, you want to shoot this shotgun? And he just hands it to me, and I'm looking at it, and I was like, yeah, that's really nice. I mean, I don't know what the hell I'm looking at, right? Yeah. He's like, yeah, that's about $70,000. I'm like, whoa, what? And I was like, yeah, there you go. And yeah. you grew up around the shotgun world, so you've yeah. seen it. So I didn't even know what we were doing, and there's this huge diameter white circle laid out on the ground. And so you would come up there, and guys are actually betting on you. And they have this machine in the middle, and they have live birds in there. And I guess somebody's inside of the box actually loading these things in. And basically, it is a piece of, I guess, material that basically, when they pull, it launches the bird into the air. Now, it shoots this damn bird like 100 feet up in the air. The bird don't know if he's upside down, sideways, right side up. And he could be going butt first up in the air. <laughs> And he comes up, and then he just takes off flying. He's like, what the no hell? No one knows where this thing's going. Your job... He doesn't even know where he's Your going. job is to shoot that bird, <laughs> and he's got to fall within the circle. You're only allowed X amount of, I guess, misses or whatever else, but whoever had the most birds in the circle was the winner. And, I mean, this was a big money thing, I guess. Well, by the end of the day, there... There were, I don't mean, guys, I'm not talking about 50, 60 birds. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of these birds. Half of them are wounded. You know, they're up in the trees over here where guys missed them or winged them or whatever. You got a pile of dead birds on the ground. And I was like, so what happens to the birds? No, well, nothing. They'll just, they'll just collect them and throw them away. Coyotes. I was little. like, yeah, I, I appreciate you inviting me. But, you know, thank you, but no thank you. So uh, did you shoot? I, I did shoot. I did shoot. How'd you do? I did really well. And I guess some people made some money off of me. Uh, I didn't get in on any betting. But uh, awesome. yeah, I didn't even stay there the whole day. I actually left early because I was like, hey, this isn't my bag of tea, but I appreciate it. This offer. isn't nice, Mr. Ray. Yeah, you know, I didn't get into that too much. There is a lot of, uh, that's a whole nother rabbit hole, shotguns. It says like a tower shoot. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know what a tower shoot is. That my my understanding of a tower for me was like doing like five stand yeah, duck, trap ski and they're shooting clays, not real birds. You know, I mean, this was this was like old school. This was like, <laughs> this was like a. It was so the funny. back there going with this. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually an awesome. Harvest stuff. what you take, it don't take. Same for fishing. I hunt and fish for food. Exactly. Yeah. And so I grew up big into fishing. I mean, huge. And I used to hunt a lot. Uh, I don't do that any longer. Um, I will still fish, but yeah, we need another R squared video, guys. I hear you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, I'm not going to kill just to kill. Yeah. The. Uh, I don't know. I, I thoroughly enjoyed sporting clays. It was fun. Well, you that know was what? My, I need to take that back. I just, you know what? Oh, don't be doing this. I still this want home. to kill a coyote. Oh, yeah. I'm going to, and some hogs. 
Yeah, and see, that would be killing just to kill it. We could have bacon, but coyote would be another one. It is a, it is considered a predator. Predator. Yeah. But I still want to shoot one. But I'm not going to shoot a hundred of them. Yeah. Don't. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. That's too much. But yeah, I caught well, myself there. The the predator, you know, a hog can be a predator to cornfields. Yeah, nuisance. Yeah. Just like deer can for farmers. You know, you can get a nuisance tag or whatever they call them, but where you can shoot them in the summer and everything no, else. Yeah, she Balsecki says it right. Another level is skeet and trap. That's it, it sounded like you're at like a gentleman's gentleman's clubhouse. Cl- oh, it's like, like everybody had these big yeah. stars and you're good, kid. You're real good, she. It's like I had no business there. I'm gonna bet thousand dollars on that little Asian guy over there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because I was, I think I was the only Asian there. Everybody else was like, I don't know who invited them, but I like them. I know I was the youngest guy there. <laughs> Who's that little guy over there? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's probably a bunch of mob mobsters. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, it, I would not doubt it. It sounds like uh, it sounds like you ended up in some cartel freaking uh, mansion or some shit, which would have been cool. Hogs would be fun. Mere polished metal surface. Yeah, coyotes are considered an invasive species. Real men shoot. Uh, you know, we had. Um, there you go, Bob Kansas. Real men shoot a hundred coyotes. See. Smoky Mountain Boys. We got to leave like a couple. That. Yeah, Smoky Mountain Boys. I know he's actually baited some. He's got some baited up right now. Yeah, because he came to my house. He bought a seventeen Winchester uh, WSM to shoot coyotes with because uh, he said uh, he wanted to try that. I'll see, and okay. Idaho Rogers says blast away. When you're a rancher and your cattle are big money running around there, that's different. You don't want those that's little different. bastards eating stuff. That is different, you know. So I have, believe it or not, I have chickens, and so yeah, yeah. if if a possum. Or a raccoon oh, yeah, starts they're... or tries to get into the big. chicken coop. And, it, it, guys, this isn't a small chicken coop. This is a, a tractor shed chicken coop. Big Country says we can go shoot his hogs in uh, Georgia. Oh, man. That would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready. I'd take you up on that one. I want to do that. But, uh, yeah, if it's a raccoon or a possum trying to get into the chicken shed, it is done for. Done. Matter of fact, you were there when I split a wig. <laughs> you made me spit, Dick. <laughs> Dude, split a wig. <laughs> That's what you call it, man. Split that wig. <laughs> well, okay, yeah. never mind. Charles Tippy says he kills about a hundred. See, what we have coyotes here, but it's, it's I guess it's a lot harder to hunt them here in Western North Carolina because they have so much cover. Yeah, there's trees. Yeah, everywhere. there's trees everywhere, and so you have to find a valley. That's like you or gotta something. go to Eagle Eye. I mean, you can see four hundred miles in each direction. That would be awesome, yeah. But that's killing the kill. Killing's killing, boy. Killing. It's killing more. All right, well, we're at an hour and 30 minutes. I hope you guys had a... Hopefully, if nothing else, we inspired you to go sign up for a match. And it can be six months from now. And you'll be you'll have time to practice. You'll have time to get that late Amazon order because everything's taking so long. Talking about Amazon order, I got my binos in, my kilos my BDX 3000s. Yeah, um, you did. Those things are really cool. So I'll show those on another video. But I think Vanessa said something about people torturing cats when they were young. Around a bunch of crazy folks killing animals. Did you torture cats when you were young? <laughs> Where'd she say that at? Ever shot a skunk? Uh, no, I have not I have ever not. shot a skunk, nor do I want to. Um, <laughs> I've hit enough of them in my vehicle to know that I don't want to be around because you, you just can't get that smell out. That's like those armadillos. Those remind me of like a video game where, like those, you know, at like I remember driving through Texas and those things were just like everywhere. It's like you had to dodge them and stuff. Ray, did Rick show you those new six millimeter projectiles? Um, I did not see them, oh. but somebody was talking about them. I think on one of the chats or something about it started with an M or something, Matrix or something like that. I don't remember. He had sent me. I don't know if it was email or text. And the only thing I ever shot was a butterfly, and it was an accident. Yeah, Vanessa Kitty, that leave them alone. Or if you guys have ever had a dog and the dog got sprayed, and then you're like, "Get out of here, dog! You stink!" <laughs> That doesn't wash off. Yeah. I don't... He, Tomato juice, I know. Yeah. All right. I don't have it. I mean, I have you know, it. I was only supposed to be here a couple minutes. I'm already late late for the house. 11 o'clock. You ain't late. You're fine. All right. Leave the skunks alone. All right. You guys have a wonderful night. Stay safe. Hopefully, again, 
an encouragement to get you guys out there. At least, hopefully, got you teetering on the fence about doing it now. Remember, you don't need all the stuff. Go have fun. Just shoot the match. Just shoot the match. Sign up. Have fun. See you guys. Have a great night. See ya. Take care.